Thank you for this opportunity to, to speak a few minutes with you regarding this agenda and what we're standing in front of and the global challenges that is ahead. I'm leading a think tank which is called a Global Utmorning Global Challenge, which means that we try to identify what is the megatrends that is driving change with inside of society and on our planet and how do we as a community face that. And the thing of a think tank is that what you try to do is to bridge science towards policy and policy makers. So as a former student in Lund, it's also exciting to be here, uh, but also a bit challenging because in the sense that Lund's university is one of the ones that is great at sustainability. What we can see in the times that we're living through is also partly the absence of science within inside of the public debate. We're living in a time of post-truth. We're living in a time where truth is mainly seen as the obstacles for populisms and those that is racing ahead. So what I want to talk about, that is, what is this agenda? How is it all connected? But also, what kind of time is it that we're living through? And what is the responsibility for us as part of the research and knowledge community, as citizens and from Sweden as a nation? Despite the insight that our way of living is not sustainable, we will continue until another paradigm is presented in front of us. That is what the scientific uh, philosopher Thomas Kohn said when it comes to shift of paradigms. And if you're thinking about the time that we're living through, when it comes to Brexit, when it comes to Trump, when it comes to Le Pen, when it comes to the Swedish Democrats, and how you can be reminded by the historians of what is the similarity what we experienced in the beginning of the 1900s and the time that we're looking at today, where democracy is hijacked to democratic elections, and then in a small but small steps towards fascism is dismantled. I think that is partly because we're seeing that society is splitting up. We can see that inequalities is arising with the inside of our societies, that our politicians doesn't have the answers to what was presented, the effects of climate change, how we're living unhealthy, and how inequality is arising. And that is splitting our communities. And we are here at the Sustainability Week, and we are somehow the bubble of progress. And that means that we're partly also the bubble of problem, in the sense that there is a lot of people which is not inside of this room, which is not part and seeing sustainability as being something forward. It was talked about progress, and a lot of people doesn't see the progress that is in front of us. We can see that through the 19th century, politicians have been fighting a battle between right and left, between capitalism and, and labor, which is not perhaps the political fight of tomorrow, or we haven't politicized it. So the question is, is this agenda, these 17 goals, which is presenting the best knowledge that we have, it because it's developed by researchers, by the business community on best practice, and by insightful people and politicians, which is setting 17 goals, 169 uh, supplementary goals, which is somehow defining where should the world be in 2030. And as Ban Ki-moon said, we are the last generation which can put an end to climate change, and we're the first that can stop poverty. But what we have to do this is in a joint agenda, where we can see that the quest for gender equality, the quest for equality and the quest for growth has to be tackled in the same time, in the same way, where we can see that all target conflicts that we haven't seen aren't present anymore. And how do we transform ourselves and how do we transform our societies of being up to task task? Well, it will take a different way of looking at economics. It was earlier presented how innovation and digitalization can be transformed into sustainable business ideas and how we can have different ways of acting and mobilizing our ways of transport within inside of cities and how that can make us be more, be more um, sustainable in our way of living and transportation and thereby being sustainable in a different manner. If you're looking at how a city was planned in the 60s, 70s, when the Swedish cities emerged, they were planned according to, they were kind of put it to how do you transport by vehicles and so on. At the think tank, we asked ourselves, what would be the effect if you, instead of planning a city by a car, planned a city from a woman, a young girl, which is coming from a less privileged area within inside of one of the greatest cities? You would have a different entrance of political, of how you are forming politics. The thing is that we have been acting in a way where we have put people like myself, middle class, white, male, in front of how we're forming our societies. And if we want to be inclusive in a very, just, in a very different way, we have to start thinking about 
what is the role that we, what is the center of politics today? And that has to be very different. Sweden in many ways have been the leader when it comes to sustainability. If you're looking at how the ranking is coming out, the Swedish welfare system is in the best ranking towards this. And at the same time, we can see that Sweden is lacking behind in a lot of areas. We can see that education within some of our schools, we can see that in the way that we are consuming, we went up from 3.7 planets of consuming to 4.2 planets, according to a published report by WWF, in the sense that we are living in a very materialized world, which is taking and tackling the resources that we have, and which is meaning that we, from a generation perspective, will not be able to, to carry through. So the Swedish society, which has come very far, is the perfect example of how do you transform in the sense that our welfare system needs to be updated and our environmental policies needs to be reshaped, and we need to think about what is the forefront that we're putting inside of politics when they are performing uh, and developing policy. If you're looking at this agenda, no poverty, zero hunger, good health and well-being, quality education, gender equality, clean water and sanitation, affordable and clean energy, decent work, economic growth, industry innovation infrastructure, reduced inequalities, sustainable cities, responsible consumption and production, climate action, life below water, life on land, peace, justice, strong institutions, partnership for the goals. You question, what kind of research question would you put forward in trying to answer this? What is the kind of systems and institutions that we need with the inside of society to interplay that is needed between research, business and politics and civil society? If you travel today between Copenhagen and Malmö, you don't any longer, or at least soon, will have to show your passport. But in somehow when you had to show that passport, that was the, for me, the sign that in somehow the nation state had failed. In the sense that the migration flow and the crisis that that meant for Europe and the system, in somehow proved that the nation state has reached its limits. We are today living in a global society where migration should be an opportunity and not a cause of crisis or war. And where we in that sense need to have different kind of social innovation. Because it was not the politicians, it was not the business community that stepped forward when it comes to shopping how should a global neighborhood look like. It was civil society in Sweden which stepped forward, which made home for people, which provided food, which took cake of pe take care of people who entered, and who provided education, language learning, and the steps into the labor market. Those kinds of social innovations that was present in the crime of the refugee crisis is the kind of social innovations which have been institutionalized from the beginning of the 19th century. Because childcare was a social innovation which was coming from civil society. Then it was institutionalized by our society. And that story can go on from pension systems to gender equality and so on. But the problem is that today we are pushing back because those megatrends are frightening us instead of moving forward and taking in civil society. And that is the question for researcher. How do you make sure that you get a more evidence-based discussion of how do we target these goals in a time when you have to act so rapidly in order to rechange how policy is formed? Because it is very clear that today's politicians on where, where the side is standing on the political island, they are not up to facing the challenge that the populists and the fascists in our century is actually putting forward. They don't have that answers. And the civil society and researchers needs to step in and to provide and help form that. Otherwise, I think that we will see democracy still eroding. And we will see that this agenda, which is perhaps the best knowledge that we have, will not be fulfilled. Because as Henrik put it, it takes political will. And that political will is drawing our society towards a different angle. And that is the discussion that we need to engage in, to step out and have that discussion and provide the tools and the means in order to make sure that we're getting a political will and that we're pushing it and that we're taking the best parts of the research community and it's developing into policy. So this agenda needs to be real for people and the question is how do we do that and how do we reach out what we try to do from the delegation side, that is not letting us, which is the current generation, form that narrative. 
but actually letting the people which were on stage before set in that narrative. What is that that we are facing 2030? What is the aim that we're living through? And that political story and that narrative, I think is more present in people's lives and minds than the political debate that you could yesterday see on television between our national political leaders. So my message here today during these short seven minutes, that is that this agenda is the best thing that has been formed and which is the same for Sweden, Tanzania, Germany, Zimbabwe, in the sense that it's agenda not for developing countries or for developed countries, but in somehow it's a something that we need to tackle together because it's one planet and it's one planet that we are cons consuming. And that is, as was said, that is a decision that needs to be taken when we stand in front of the polls. It needs a decision to be taken when we stand in front of our next meal, when we're standing in front of our car or in front of our bicycle, but mainly when we're standing outside on the streets. Who are we talking to and who are we not talking to? How are we forming our cities and how are we launching the discussion on sustainability? So it doesn't continue to be elitist discussion by establishment, which can see the research solutions and which can see these different goals, but doesn't manage to make a conversation, which means that we meet each other, looking into our eyes, and thereby form a different community. Because I'm deeply worried where we're going towards, and that is the part of segregation that needs to be broken. And these 17 goals and academic language will not solve it. But us as humans, we most probably have the tools in pushing forward for that agenda and trying to say that there is something different that can be formed, something different that actually holds some sort of future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Johan Hassel. Um, give it another try. Please, uh, step forward again. Uh, the Millennium Goals yes. they were quite severely critiqued for not being um, addressing and implement sort of the, the process uh, of writing them. Uh, the people that were uh, affected by the goals weren't really involved. And after what I've heard, the, this process and uh, taking and writing these goals have been very different. Yes, as I said, uh, they've been shaped in the, by the business community, by researchers, by politicians. Morgan Slifketov, who shared the uh, UN General Assembly when it was adopted, asked himself, how come that the politicians have taken such an ambitious agenda? And I said, it's because they haven't formed it. And what I think is here as well, you see that politicians doesn't form the new narrative. You have this setting up of the welfare state within inside of Sweden, being a pro-liberal market economy, and basically forming uh, a global narrative when it comes to trade. That was a political agenda. But today, politicians, those agendas have come to an end. Alan Lawson, who used to share this university, mm -hmm. is one of the senior advisors to the think tanks. And he wrote a paper of, how do I understand the time that I'm living through? In the sense that from his perspective, he couldn't understand what time are we living through, what is the economic narrative? What is the political fight that is being fought? And what is actually the vision that we're striving ahead to? So we wrote this paper and he said to us at the think tank that, I'm not the one that should have the answer on this. What I can say is that I don't understand what is happening in society today. And someone needs to formulate an answer because we're living in a turbulent and rough times. And I think that is the main message. And that message isn't formed in our, coming back to your question, that isn't formed in our nor ordinary conversations. That has to be formed on the streets as to strive for a different kind of inclusive society was 100 years ago. And you can see by the refugee crisis that that discussion has to be formed with different kind of players. And us with inside of this room have the responsibility of dragging them into the conversation. Mm -hmm. And that is so great that Lund is throwing a sustainability week and that the university realizes that it needs to step out of its academic corridors in order to get the impulse, but also provide the solutions. Thank you very much, Johan Hassel.